I have no. Open your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Daniel, chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3, and we're going to start in verse number 13. And let me say briefly before we stand and read the passage, we're, we're so thankful and grateful to be able to be here with you for this for the conference. I enjoyed hearing from both uh, Brother Doug Summerdorf and Brother David Summerdorf this morning. It was a great blessing in church this morning. I just pray that God will use the message tonight and that you'll leave encouraged. Daniel chapter 3, join me in standing if you're able to. Daniel chapter 3, verse number 13. We won't go into a lot of the history of the passage. It's very familiar, talking about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So we'll start in verse number 13. Follow along with me if you would. The Bible says there, Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do ye not serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if you worship not, you shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? He's a mouthy fellow, wasn't he? Verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. I love the attitude with which these men approached this situation. They didn't talk about it. They didn't discuss it amongst themselves. They decided long before this ever happened this is what we are going to do we will live for Christ regardless they had already decided before circumstance demanded a decision look at it look in verse number verse number 17 if it be so our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of thine hand O king here is the whole crux of the passage hangs on these three words but if not, be it known unto thee, O king, we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. I want to preach to you a message entitled this, But If Not. Father, we come before you this, this evening. Thank you so much for the singing from the choir, from the congregation, for the special. I pray that you would put your hand on the message, that you would take me out of the way. God, I pray you'd calm my nerves and clear up my speech, that I might speak your word clearly and concisely the way you would have it to be said. If there's anything I planned on saying that you'd not have me say, I pray you'd remove it from my heart and from my mind, that I would only speak the things you want me to say. I pray that you would bless these people for their faithfulness and their attendance and their presence and service tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you for standing. Look again, if you would, in verse number 17. I want you to see this before we go further on to the message. In verse 17, If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And there's a comma and a little extra phrase after that. And he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. Do you realize what they were saying? What they were saying in those few words was whether he physically delivers us or whether we burn, either way, we are delivered from you. You cannot harm us. God's going to deliver us this way or this way. And whatever he chooses, we will be delivered. That, to me, this passage, even in Old Testament, speaks to me of the faith that we should have in the New Testament age. Age. That's the faith we ought to have. I'm a young guy. Not, not, not an old man, not quite yet. i got some white coming in my beard. And the teenagers at church, they, they love to point that out. It's a little white coming in that beard. I'm still a young guy. I grew up in a preacher's home. And if you're in ministry or you've you've been around your pastor very much, you understand that when you are in ministry, there, there is some stuff that happens. If you work with people, you understand there's stuff that happens. People are the same everywhere you go. They have problems. We are all petty. We are all mean at times. We like to all gossip at times. And it just seems like the preacher is a pretty easy target. He really does. Preacher makes an easy target. Because there he is. And he's by himself. And nobody's going to hear. Nobody's going to know. It's just my wife. And we, we zing the preacher sometimes. And growing up in a preacher's home, I saw firsthand sometimes things would happen to my dad. And it seemed like they just never got resolved. 
And as a kid and as a teenager and an adult, I would look at that and say, God, you see what they're doing. You know it's not right. You could fix this. What are you doing? And it seems like in our Christian lives, sometimes we cry out to God and say, God, you could fix this. I've got a problem. I've got a heartache. I've got trouble. And you could fix it. Where's my resolution? God, where's my answer? Where are you? You could fix this. And it seems like it goes unresolved. And it seems like it goes unresolved. Where is my resolution? Where is my answer? I want you to see verse 17. Verse 17, look at this. Our God whom we serve is able to deliver us. Would you agree with me for just a couple of minutes that no matter the problem you face, no matter the trouble you have, and I am not minimizing your trouble. We have all got problems. I've got problems. You've got problems. We could talk about it all night. We all have trouble. Man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upwards. We have problems. But would you agree with me that an almighty, holy, and mighty God is able to fix those problems? Is he able to take care of those issues? God is able, is He not? God could take care of it in a moment, could He not? Situations we couldn't handle, we don't know what to do, God could fix it in a moment. According to the passage, these men are facing the greatest power in the land. They're facing Nebuchadnezzar. Power of life and death is in this guy's hands. Whatever he wants to do with them, he can do, and nobody's going to say anything about it. And as a Christian in the New Testament age, have you never felt... That sometimes you're just in somebody else's hand and they're doing whatever they want with you. And you wonder, where is my resolution? Where is my God? Where is my answer? And the answer to that is not in verse number 17. The answer to that is in verse number 18. Look at the first three words of that. This is what defines the faithfulness of a New Testament Christian. These guys were prepared. These guys had already decided to live by faith. They knew God could deliver. In verse number 18, we see the depth of their faith. Verse 18, God is able to deliver, but if not, we are going to serve Him anyway. We're going to serve Him anyway. But the matter I've got a problem and God could solve it. But if he doesn't, will you serve him anyway? We're going to go to Iraq and I've got dreams. I want a big church here and a big church here. And I want the Bible translated. I want thousands saved. But if not, it's my job to serve him anyway. You've got a problem and a trouble in your life. God could fix it in a moment. But what determines your faithfulness as a Christian is not what God does for you. It is what you do regardless of the blessings that come your way. Way. God is able to deliver, but if not, will you serve Him anyway? Will we serve Him anyway? God can fix everything that's wrong with it. And there's a few things. God can fix everything wrong with this country in a moment. You know that, right? But if He doesn't, will we serve Him anyway? God can make it easy for us to go to Kurdistan. He could make it easy for us to go. But if not, I'm supposed to go anyway. God can make it easy to knock doors in Austin, Texas. But if he doesn't, it is your job, Trinity, to, to knock doors anyway. But if not, serve him anyway. We as, we as American Christians, we, we, like, uh, we like safety nets. Americans love safety nets. We really do. We like financial safety nets. We like a church safety net. We, we like safety nets everywhere we go. That's why we have airbags in cars. We have stoplights. We have stops. Everything is a safety net to protect us from harm. So we get to this point where we think, we're looking through the Bible, well, where's my safety net? Where's my, if I make this decision, if I follow God... Pastor, if I do what God says, what if this? What if that? I surrender my life. What if God decides this? What if God decides that? What if I face this? There is no promise in the Bible of safety for our lives. There is only the promise of God's guidance and His blessing so that no matter what happens, but if not, we will serve Him anyway. 
we are not guaranteed. We have people ask us all the time, how safe is it over there? And I understand the question. It is not my job to be safe in Iraqi Kurdistan. It is my job to go regardless of the consequences. It is not my job to be safe everywhere we go in Kurdistan. It is our job to start churches, to plant churches, to win souls, to train preachers. God can deliver us from any situation, but if not, we serve Him anyway. That is my job. That is your job as a Christian at Trinity in Austin. God could deliver me, but if not, I will serve Him anyway. I will serve Him anyway. We serve a God that could fix anything in this universe in a moment. We know He can. What He's looking for is, will you serve Him if He doesn't? He is looking for faithfulness. God doesn't need talented people. There's talented people. God's looking for willing people. He's not looking for the person with the most ability. He's looking for someone who is willing to serve regardless of the consequences, regardless of the cost. And I'm not talking about being a preacher, and I'm not talking about being a missionary. Sometimes we get the mistaken idea that, uh, oh, you guys are going to Rocky Kurdistan. You'll suffer more than we will. Let me tell you this. There are guys that work a blue-collar job, 8 hours, 10 hours, 12 hours a day, oil field workers that face as much trial and as much temptation as any missionary does on the mission field. You sitting in here, you work, you face temptation and struggles and troubles every single day, no different than what I face. It's the same. The same God that I'm supposed to serve is the same God that you're supposed to serve. The same God that can keep us safe is the same God that can keep you safe. The same God that guides our steps over there is the same God that guides our steps over here. And it's the same God that can deliver us, but if not... We must serve Him anyway. Amen. We must serve Him anyway. Look at a couple of things, if you would, in verse, uh, verse number 18. It says this, But if not, be it known unto thee, O King, we will not serve thy gods. He made a distinction there between our God and thy gods. We've got a few gods. As American, I'm, re I'm really focusing on American Christians tonight because that's just what I am. Thy gods, the one thing... The one thing that will stop you dead in your tracks from giving your life to God. And when I say that, church, understand this. I'm not talking about you surrendering to be a preacher or a missionary, whatever. You know what's on your heart. You know what God wants you to do. When I say give your life to God, it means you put your heart on the altar and you don't take it back. That's what I'm talking about. Surrender is I put my heart here and God, that belongs to you. You take it. You do with it whatever you want to do. That is surrender. That's what God's looking for. The one thing that will keep you from that is fear. Fear. If something could define Americans, it would be fear. We are scared of everything. We are scared of everything. Watch the nightly news. What is it? Oh, this horrible thing happened over here. What are we going to do about it? This horrible thing happened over here. What are we going to do about it? Oh, no, look what happened here. Look what this person did to this person. And they did this back and then this happened. And by the time you're done with the news, you got to take a pill just to calm your nerves. Why? Fear. Fear. We live on it. We thrive on it in our culture. We're scared of everything. White House says we're going to do this. 1,500 Christians, 15 million crawl across in every church. Did you hear what President Obama's going to do? Did you hear? Did you hear? Did you hear? And you know what it does? I'm scared. I'm scared. That's all. It's all I'm scared. I'm scared. I'm scared. And we got a holy Bible. And we got a holy God. And he gets put over here. And the nightly news gets put right here. That's exactly what happens. We're scared of everything. We have insurance. Why? Because we're scared of everything. I'm not picking on insurance. Don't go out of here and say, well, Brother Matt thinks it's dumb to have insurance. Brother Matt has some insurance. <laughs> but you know why we have insurance? Because we're scared. Because we're scared of everything. What keeps you from serving God, number one, is fear of others. What are they going to think of me if I do this? But Matt, you don't understand. If I surrender my life and then I go back into that workplace, I gotta fix some things. I gotta fix a testimony with some guys. I've said some things, I've done some things, I've associated myself with some things, and I'd have to change that. 
And it's fear. It's fear. And that will hold you from putting your heart on that altar. Fear. Can I tell you this? God could make it easy for you to do that. But if not, will you surrender anyway? Will you really allow your fear of what somebody thinks of you to determine the destiny of someone else's soul? Are we so afraid of what others think of us, we're unwilling to live a Christian, godly life in front of them so that they might have a chance to hear of Jesus Christ? We have a fear of God. Not a good fear of God. A lot of Christians refuse to surrender their lives because they're scared to death. God might actually do something with it. He might actually call me to do something. But the matter, I will go up there and lay my heart on the altar, dot, 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 as long as. But the matter, I, I just, I, I can't teach. Well, maybe God's not asking you to. But the matter, I, I can't preach, and I can't sing, and I can't do this, and I can't do this. You know where all that comes from? Fear. It comes from fear. We serve a God that took these men and delivered them out of a fiery furnace. We have no reason to fear. We have no reason to fear. The test of a Christian's faithfulness is not whether or not they are afraid. We will have fear for the rest of our lives. We will face that every day. Every one of us in this room. The test of a Christian's faithfulness comes in how you respond in spite of the fear and how you act while you are afraid. I hate Six Flags over Texas. I have always hated Six Flags. As a youth pastor, when you go to these places, you are required to ride these rides. There, there is no opt-out. You do not get to stand. I mean, there's, there's really nothing manly about standing by the garbage can where everybody else is throwing up, getting off the ride, going, Hi, sweetie. Is it fun? There's nothing manly about that. Say, Brother Matt, do you like heights? Absolutely not. God did not make Matt Haynes for heights, and he did not make heights for Matt Haynes. I can't stand him. But I married a woman that loves it. You can't tell me God didn't have a little bit of a sense of humor. I think sometimes he's just got this sense of irony. He goes, they'll match well together, and I can have fun watching Haynes squirm. <laughs> Say, Brother Matt, did you ride the rides? I did ride the rides. Did you like them? I hated every minute of it. Every second of it. Would you do it again? Yeah, I'd probably do it again. What are you saying, Brother Matt? You're not always going to get over that fear of others. But you can still serve God through that fear. We have a fear of failure. That keeps people from putting their heart on the altar and surrendering to God. We're scared of failure. But Matt, you, you don't understand. I can't speak very well. I can't sing very well. I, I don't relate to people that well. And because of that, why don't I just sit back and we'll let the other people that can do it well do that. That's not what God asked for in the scripture. That's not what he's looking for. The Bible doesn't say that these three guys were great speakers. It doesn't say they were great teachers. The Bible didn't say they were great anything. All we get from this passage is that these three men were faithful to do what God said. They knew God could deliver them. But if not, I'll serve him anyway. If God has called you to something, if you've not surrendered your life, if you let fear stand in the way of that surrender, you'll never get past it. You'll never get past it. That joy that comes from giving, like the pastor was talking about a minute ago, with a good attitude, you'll never get there because you're scared of your finances. You'll never get the joy of giving because you're scared of what's going to happen to your finances. You're afraid. And you don't get that joy because when you do give, it's grudgingly. And it's of necessity. Well, if I don't, preacher might see the envelopes and know I didn't tithe, so I better put it in there. It's grudgingly and of necessity. And God loves a cheerful giver. And what did the preacher say about giving? Not everybody's best is the same. It's the same way in Christian service, folks. Not everybody's best is the same, but everybody has a best, and everybody can give their best if we are willing to get past the fear, see a God that is able to use us in spite of ourselves. Amen. He can give me the ability to teach, but if not, I'll follow His calling anyway. God can make it easy for us in Kurdistan. He really could. God could just line it up for us. And He's done a lot. God has performed some miracles for us. He really has. He could make it easy for us to get in there. But if not, what, what do I come back and tell you, hey, we couldn't make it, it was too hard? 
That, that's not what you want to hear. That's not what you're expecting from a missionary. It doesn't matter the difficulty. God called you, Matt Haynes. You need to get your hide over there and do what he's called you to do. Well, church, has God, are you not a church, a called out assembly? Has God not called us into the ministry of reaching others for the gospel of Christ? Then is that not what we're supposed to do regardless of the difficulty? God is able to deliver, but if not, we've got to serve him anyway. Look at that last part of the passage. We'll be done in just a moment. Verse 18. It says, O king, we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. We set up some golden images as Americans. We really do. The, the golden image that we set up mostly in our American churches is the golden image of unrealistic expectations. Unrealistic expectations of other people. We expect a whole lot from other people. Now here's the thing, church. The only person that I can fix is me, and I can't fix me. So what in the world am I doing trying to fix you? I can't fix you. I can't fix me. My job is to make sure that Matt Haynes is doing what Matt Haynes is supposed to do, where he's supposed to be, when he's supposed to be, doing what he's supposed to do. What you can't do is say, well, well Pastor, I was here for the whole conference. Where was everybody else? I was in my place. Where was everybody else? Well, I showed up for that morning prayer and I prayed the whole time. How long did everybody else pray? Well, I was there. It is not my job to police the body of Christ and make sure that everybody's doing what everybody's supposed to do. I've got to make sure that I am in my place where God told me to be doing what I am supposed to do regardless of what anybody else does. Regardless. Why is it that of all the Jews that were there, only three were signaled out as guys that didn't bow? And you notice they didn't complain about everybody else that wasn't there. They simply focused on what they were supposed to do. They were looking to the God they knew could deliver. If he did, praise God. If he didn't, we will serve him anyway. He'll deliver or we'll see him real soon. was their attitude. It is not my job to worry about what everybody else and every other pew is doing. My job is to make sure I am seated where I am supposed to be seated, listening when I am supposed to listen so that God can lead me as God wants to lead me. That's my job. What happens is we put unrealistic expectations on other people. Pastor, I was here for the whole conference. You know what he said? Some people work and their hours do not, are not conducive to showing up. Well, Brother Matt, if they wanted to make it, I'll bet you they could have. That is such a pharisaical attitude. Nobody in here knows everything except maybe the preacher. Nobody in here knows everything else that's going on in everybody else's life. It is my job. If I am able to do this, I need to be here. If I am not able to do this, I need to be the best testimony at work that I can be. If I am not able to be at work, I've got to be the best testimony over here that I can be. Wherever I am, it must be where God has told me to be doing the best that I can do for the Lord Jesus Christ, not worried about where everybody else is and what everybody else is doing. You put unrealistic expectations on other people and they'll never meet them. They never will. They never will meet them. And then we get resentful and we get angry and we get bitter at those people because they're not doing everything that we're doing. You, you'll get upset at your preacher if you put those expectations on your pastor. You really will. Well, he's a preacher. He should do fill in the blank with whatever you want. Well, he's the pastor. He shouldn't say fill in the blank. Well, well, yeah, but, 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 but brother, brother Matt, he's supposed to be more spiritual than everybody else and he's supposed to do this and supposed to do this. And we're so worried about what he's doing that we've totally lost focus on what God is trying to show us. And you resent people that you put unrealistic expectations on. Hey, haven't you ever at your work been given a task in life, been given a task, you couldn't meet those expectations and the person that gave them to you got mad at you for it. You knew you couldn't do it when they gave it to you. You told them you couldn't do it when they gave it to you and they still expected you to perform it anyway. We ought not be having that in the body of Christ. If you want to put expectations on somebody... <laughs> But we'll get that in just a second. We put unrealistic expectations on other people. We put unrealistic expectations on God. We put unrealistic expectations on God. Is there any one of us in here that has every answer for everything that has happened in our lives? I don't. 
I got some questions I would love answered. God, why did this happen? God, what about this? I'll tell you a question I'd love answered is, I'm 33 years old. And I look back at my life and I just wonder, God, what is it that I could have done that would have got me over to Kurdistan sooner? What is it I didn't do? What could I have done that would have gotten me there sooner? What is it that you should have, could have shown me? What is it I didn't see? And we put unrealistic expectations on God and on ourselves. These men did not expect to be saved from the fire. They only expected that God could save them if He wanted to. But if not, they were going to serve Him regardless. It is not my job to worry about, God, when are you going to get me to Kurdistan? It is my job to make sure that tonight I am doing what God wants me to do. Tomorrow morning, doing what God wants me to do. And the next day, doing what God wants me to do. And trust that in His time, Time, he will put me in Kurdistan but if he comes before that it is my job to serve him anyway can I be honest with you I want to get to the field before God comes back I, I want to get to Kurdistan before the Lord comes back these people need to be saved my people need to be saved my people don't have a preacher there isn't a church like this in Kurdistan there is no Baptist church in Kurdistan. There is no true gospel witness. My people can't hear. They didn't get to hear. It's tomorrow over there. But yesterday, there wasn't a church open like this. There wasn't anybody there. And my people didn't get to hear. And nobody opened up the scriptures and told my people how they could be saved. And there wasn't an altar call for my people. And there wasn't a special song. And there wasn't a message preached. So, Brother Matt, what are you going to do about that? Everything I can to get to the field before he comes back. But if he comes back before I get there, it is my job to serve him no matter what. I believe God will protect our lives while we're over there. I believe that he will. But if not, if he takes her, it's my job to serve him anyway. If he takes me from her, it is her job to serve him anyway. If we get over there and nothing goes as planned, my job is to serve Him anyway. God could open every door in Kurdistan. Brother Matt, what are you going to do if you get over there and nobody wants to listen? Serve Him anyway. Brother Matt, what if you get over there and everything crashes around you and the government goes to pieces? We're going to serve Him anyway. Brother Matt, what, do you want to, what are you going to do? When you get over there, and you find out people aren't as excited about you coming as you thought they were. I'm going to serve him anyway. Because what do you do when you knock on a door? Somebody says no thanks and slams it. You serve him anyway. What do you do when that kid you've been praying for and you just knew they were going to come to Sunday school? You just knew they were going to come to Sunday school and they didn't show up. What do you do? Quit? No! You serve him anyway. You pray again. And you pray again. And you pray again. We serve a God of impossibilities. There is nothing that he can't do. Anything that I can conceive for the Kurdish people, he has got greater plans. I want to see my people saved. I cannot begin to fathom how much he wants to see my people saved. But regardless of what happens, it is my job to serve him anyway. Last thing and we'll be done. We put unrealistic expectations on ourselves. Do you know why God gave you a pastor and leaders in the church? So that everybody wouldn't be trying to be a leader and a pastor in the church. You realize that you are a complete body of Christ. You know that? You realize that the church is local and visible and you represent a complete body of Christ. From head to toe. You represent the body of Christ. But not every part of the body does what every other part of the body does. Can you realize how re absolutely ridiculous I would look if I took my hands off and stuck them where my feet are and took my feet off and stuck them where my hands are? Wouldn't I look stupid? Can you imagine somebody, I mean, try to wipe your nose like that? Boy, that would be awkward. You're kicking yourself in the face. With your hand. How, that doesn't even make sense. It'd look goofy. It wouldn't look in order, would it? Brother Matt, I'm telling you what, 
my position is important in the church. Okay, well, I'm glad you feel it's that way. Let's say we took the eyes and stuck them where the feet are and took the feet and stuck them where the eyes were. It doesn't work, does it? I mean, just picturing that in your head. What, are you going to walk on your face? And see out the bottom of your legs? That wouldn't look creepy at all. Try and go to a drive through like that. you got your legs swung up over the back here. Yes, I'd like uh, just a moment. And you swing up here so your mouth can talk. And you swing back so your eyes can see. See, Brother Matt, that sounds ridiculous. It is ridiculous, isn't it? Because every part of the body serves the purpose that God intended for that part of the body to do. you got this part, which is the pastor. you got this part, which is the body of Christ. Don't put unrealistic expectations on yourself that you've got to be Pastor Burkholder. You can't be him. That's why God made him him. You can't be him. And he can't be you. So what is he going to do without you? And what are you going to do without him? He doesn't work without you and you don't work without him. It doesn't function. But together, it makes up a complete body of Christ. And what does the scripture say? Some parts may seem a little weaker than others. But God gets glory, not from your triumphs, but from our faithfulness. Our lives are intended to bring honor and glory to God regardless of the circumstances. God is able to deliver. Would you agree with me on that? That we serve a mighty and an amazing God and He could fix every single thing in an instant, in a moment's notice. He could align these planets, this world, and make it paradise. He could fix every problem you have in your life and He could do it like this. But if not, serve Him anyway. He could make this Christian life easy, but if not, serve Him anyway. He can fix my heartaches, but if not, I've got to serve Him anyway. He can heal my hurts, but if not, I'm going to serve Him anyway. You know where the glory comes in? The glory comes in not in the healing, not in the fixing. The glory comes in for Christ when while we suffer, we are faithful. We are faithful. God is able to deliver us from a burning, fiery furnace. And I bet you you've got some in your life. But if not, serve Him anyway. Pastor. stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the message we've heard from Thy Word, and I pray that this thought will grab a hold of our hearts, and that indeed, down on the very deep inside of us, we'll determine that we're just going to serve Thee as best we can, by Thy grace, by Thy help, in Thy power. I pray, O oh God, you'll give us that attitude for such. I pray you'll give us the stamina for such. I pray thee, Lord God, that you'll give us the aptitude for such. On this invitation, our Father in heaven, I commit unto thee.